My name's Julia, and I'm 30 years old. I work at a company that creates designs for printed materials like flyers and catalogs. Despite everything going digital these days, I find my job designing for various businesses incredibly fulfilling. Whenever clients tell me they loved how a design turned out, especially for something like a Christmas event, it really makes my day. You could say this job is my passion, and there was a time I thought it might just be me and my career for life. One day, while I was mulling over this idea, my dad had to be rushed to the hospital because his appendix was acting up. That's where I met James, the kind doctor who greeted me. At that time, he was just another face in the hospital, asking if I was there to visit someone. Little did I know, James would become a huge part of my life, first as my boyfriend and now my fiancé. It's funny how life works, you find the most significant changes in the most unexpected places. Even though I always say my job is my top priority, I caught myself getting super excited about marriage, flipping through wedding magazines the moment the topic comes up. I guess I'm really looking forward to this new chapter. But not everyone seems happy about my happiness. My sister, for instance, has always had this way of looking down on me, and now on James too. It's like the more content I became, the more upset she got. It's strange seeing her face change over time, from the cute sister I once knew to someone who always seems angry. Her attitude made me incredibly frustrated, pushing my patience beyond its limits. This whole situation makes me wonder why people who only know how to belittle others often end up with such bitterness etched on their faces. It's as if their outer appearance begins to reflect the negativity they carry inside. Meanwhile, I'm just here, trying to navigate my way through life, finding joy in my work, and now, in my engagement to James. Life is full of surprises, and I'm learning to embrace them, one day at a time. While I was enjoying a quiet afternoon, sipping tea in our living room and flipping through magazines, an unexpected interruption occurred. My sister, Emily, who is three years my junior, snatched the magazine right out of my hands. To my surprise, it was a bridal magazine I was looking at, and Emily couldn't help but question why I was interested in such a thing. I tried to brush it off, telling her it was none of her business, but Emily always had a way of making everything about her. Emily has always been quite upfront, especially about her dating life, proudly stating she's never been single. She launched into stories about her current boyfriend, even though no one asked. It's been the same ever since we were kids. Emily, with her charming looks, was everyone's favorite. She grew up spoiled, constantly affirmed by our parents and everyone else, which made her believe she was the center of the universe. This attitude led her to look down on me, treating me as if I was beneath her. Don't stand too close. I don't want people to think we're alike. She'd say, or, why bother studying? It's not like you'll get better grades. Her arrogance knew no bounds, constantly flaunting her popularity and assuming I was envious. Even when our parents tried to correct her behavior, it was as if Emily's arrogance was set in stone. She never missed a chance to belittle me, a routine that became the backdrop of our relationship. But one day, I'd had enough. As she went on about her latest boyfriend, I calmly revealed that I, too, had someone in my life. In fact, we were engaged in planning our wedding, which is why I was looking at bridal magazines. Emily was taken aback, skepticism written all over her face. She mocked, doubting anyone could truly appreciate me. But when she questioned what my fiancé could possibly see in me, I confidently responded that he was drawn to my optimism and cheerfulness. Her disbelief only grew, suggesting he must see me more as a caretaker than a partner. Yet, despite her harsh words, I knew the truth of my worth and the genuine love my fiancé and I shared, something Emily's cynicism couldn't tarnish. In my determination to maintain my career post-marriage, I hope to convey to my fiancé that being the perfect housewife wasn't in my plans. This revelation led to an exaggerated response from my sister, Emily, who seemed shocked at the idea of me working after getting married. 
Are you marrying someone without money? She quipped, implying that my future husband must be struggling financially for me to continue working. Her insinuation irritated me, but I clarified that money wasn't the issue. My fiancé James was a doctor with a stable income, I simply wanted to pursue my career. My sister fell silent after my comeback, muttering something under her breath as I walked away, feeling a mix of annoyance and satisfaction. The next step in our marriage preparation was introducing James to my family. The atmosphere was warm and welcoming until Emily made her appearance, dramatically altering the vibe. She complimented James on his looks, canceling her plans to meet him, despite my hope she'd be absent. My history with Emily made me anxious. She had a track record of luring away my boyfriends during our school days. Though we were now adults, and I hadn't dated much since then, her sudden interest in James brought back old fears. However, I tried to convince myself that Emily had grown up and wouldn't attempt anything with my fiancé. Despite my hopes, seeing Emily and James interact with what appeared to be a blush from James filled me with dread, and then my worst nightmare unfolded. James announced he wanted to call off our engagement, having fallen for Emily, who claimed it was inevitable since James found her more attractive. She brazenly justified her actions, stating James had passionately proposed to her, declaring it a crime to be as charming as she was. Next to her James, my now ex fiance laughed off the situation, expressing regret for not realizing sooner how cute my sister was. This turn of events was a harsh reminder of the pattern that seemed destined to repeat itself, no matter how much I hoped it wouldn't. Emily's lack of remorse and James's cavalier attitude left me in a state of shock and heartbreak, showcasing a betrayal I had never anticipated. Realizing the truth about James's feelings and his ease in shifting affections to my sister left me with a profound sense of relief. The moment I saw his insincere smile, any affection I had for him disappeared completely, leaving behind only a feeling of revulsion. I found myself grateful for the breakup, appreciating that I discovered his true nature before we were married. I'm actually relieved I didn't marry someone who could switch his affections so easily. Consider him a parting gift, I told my sister, genuinely content with the outcome. My sister and James mistook my sincerity for bitterness, accusing me of being a sore loser. But it wasn't about losing, it was about recognizing I deserved better. Their inability to see beyond their shallow victory made me realize any further interaction was pointless. Interacting with you is a waste of my time. Goodbye. Their taunts of me being a sore loser followed me out, but their words didn't sting me if anything. They confirmed my decision to move on was the right one. Afterward, our paths never crossed again, partly thanks to our parents, who, outraged by their behavior, cut ties with them. I heard they married, but by then, it no longer mattered to me. Five years later, at 35, I remained dedicated to my career, finding satisfaction in my work. It was during this time that I met Gary, a client who grew to appreciate my works so much that he began requesting me specifically. Our professional relationship gradually became personal, and soon, he was asking me to dinner, and then on a date. Eventually, Gary proposed, and I was genuinely happy. He was sincere and kind a stark contrast to my past experience with James. However, the shadow of my previous engagement lingered, making me cautious. I decided to be honest with Gary, sharing the story of my sister and my ex fiancé even showing him a picture of my sister to gauge his reaction. Gary simply glanced at the photo before turning away with a disinterested look, offering me a reassuring smile instead. I've met plenty of people considered attractive, but none of them moved me. I used to think maybe I'd end up alone because of that. But meeting you changed my mind. It's not about external beauty, it's the inner beauty that matters. And that's what I see in you, Julia, he explained. His words made me pause, surprised and touched. What do you mean? I asked, seeking clarity. Gary smiled. In my line of work, 
I've learned to see beyond appearances. No matter how beautiful or charming someone might be, it's the beauty inside that truly counts. That's what drew me to you. You're the person I've been searching for. Hearing this, I felt a deep sense of relief and validation. Gary's understanding and perspective were exactly what I needed to hear, helping to heal the wounds left by my past experiences. His words reassured me that not everyone would betray trust as my sister and James had, and that genuine connections, based on real appreciation and respect, were possible. During a conversation about work, Gary shared with me how he found my enthusiasm and joy for life truly captivating. He described me as bright and beautiful, saying my happiness was evident and that it made me shine. I couldn't help but feel embarrassed by his words, telling him to stop because it was just too much for me. But Gary, undeterred, continued to express his admiration, insisting that I was more charming and beautiful than anyone else he'd ever met. He was sincere in his desire for us to start dating with the intention of marriage. Despite my protests that it was too embarrassing, his compliments didn't cease, even after we agreed to date. Eventually, Gary and I got married, and our life together has been wonderful. We've grown even closer than before, sharing household responsibilities and enjoying our time together, especially on days off when we'd explore new places or check out furniture for our home. One day, while looking at furniture, I encountered someone from my past, my sister Emily, accompanied by my ex fiance James. Emily's appearance had changed. Her features seemed more severe, perhaps a reflection of her age or the deepening of her personality. James, who was smirking beside her, looked like he had lost some weight. Their presence was unexpected, and Emily's voice was unmistakable as she remarked on my appearance, insinuating that I looked plain. Their condescending attitude hadn't changed, with Emily implying that the store's upscale and imported furniture wasn't meant for people like me. James echoed her sentiments, suggesting my presence might lower the store's reputation and hinted it was best if I left to avoid any confusion about their financial status. This encounter was a stark reminder of the past, but it also highlighted the stark contrast between my current, fulfilling life with Gary and the superficiality I had left behind. Despite their attempt to belittle me, I found their attitudes more pitiful than hurtful, knowing the depth of love and respect in my own marriage was something they could not understand or diminish. The harsh and condescending words from my sister and her husband were trying, but I knew engaging with them was pointless. Their loud critiques about my supposed financial status began drawing unwanted attention from others in the store. Frustrated and ready to leave, I tried to pull my husband, Gary, away, but he stood firm, catching the notice of my sister and her husband for the first time. Who's this? My sister demanded, surprised to learn that Gary was my husband. Her reaction was a mix of shock and mockery, questioning why he would marry someone playing like me and jokingly asking if he was in need of a maid. She bragged about her comfortable life, dining out frequently and hiring housekeeping, implying that Gary and I were less fortunate for needing to work. My sister's patronizing tone and her extension of her sentences in a particularly annoying manner only fueled my frustration. She gloated over stealing my previous fiancé, suggesting Gary and I were doomed to a life of hardship and mocking us for being a perfect match in her eyes. The insults towards me were bearable, but the moment she disparaged my husband, my patience snapped. I was ready to confront her, but Gary calmly stepped in front of me, introducing himself as my husband. Despite their dismissive reaction to his name, Gary remained polite and even offered his business card to James. This gesture seemed to momentarily pause the conversation as James glanced at the card, but my sister's attitude remained unchanged, continuing to belittle me as if it were a truth universally acknowledged. In this moment, Gary's composure and the dignified way he handled the situation made me realize the stark contrast between the shallow, materialistic values my sister held and the genuine, respectful love and partnership 
I shared with Gary. His calmness in the face of their provocation underscored the strength and depth of our relationship, highlighting that true value lies not in outward appearances or material wealth, but in character and integrity. Gary, always the picture of politeness, didn't shy away from confronting my sister's rudeness with a cunning clarity. To judge someone as ugly based on looks alone is shallow. But if we're talking about ugliness, your stems from within, from a personality that delights in belittling others, he said calmly, his words slicing through the air with precision. My sister, so often unflappable in her self-assuredness, found herself blushing deeply, outraged at the suggestion she might be the one at fault. Ugly? Me? How so? She sputtered, genuinely thrown off by the accusation. A truly beautiful person doesn't feel the need to overshadow or harm their sibling. Could it be that your actions towards Julia stem from jealousy, from a desire to surpass someone you actually admire? Gary proposed, unsettling her further. The thought had never crossed my mind that my sister's constant competitiveness and cruelty could be rooted in anything other than disdain. But seeing her reaction, I couldn't help but reconsider the dynamics of our relationship. Gary continued, suggesting that envy was the real motive behind my sister's actions. Taking what belongs to someone else isn't just theft, it's a clear sign of envy. It indicates a struggle with self-worth and confidence. A truly confident person wouldn't need to assert their superiority by diminishing others. My sister tried to defend herself against Gary's observations, but her rebuttals grew weaker, her usual bravado fading. It was then that James, pale and noticeably shaken, intervened. He had been quietly observing, flipping the business card Gary had given him back and forth, his unease growing. Suddenly, he grasped my sister, demanding in a troubled voice, What's happening? Who is this man? The business card, a seemingly innocuous piece of paper, had become the catalyst for a shift in the air, prompting questions and revealing the undercurrents of insecurity and rivalry that had long defined my sister's actions. It was a moment of revelation, showing that beneath the surface of her confident exterior lay a complex web of emotions, and perhaps a begrudging respect for me that she herself had not fully acknowledged. I remembered the name sounded familiar, so I did a bit of digging, and then it clicked, Gary Henry. So, what about it? My sister asked, confused. That's the name of the hospital I work at, I said, a realization dawning on her face. A hospital, she echoed, still not putting the pieces together. Yes, Henry Medical Association, I clarified, watching her face change as she connected the dots. He's Dr. Henry's son, the director and head of the hospital, she stammered, disbelief in her tone. She tried to dismiss it as a coincidence, citing the commonality of the surname. But I knew for sure. I've seen him at the hospital with the director. I didn't recognize him at first because I only saw him from afar, but now it's clear, I admitted. My sister speculated that Gary must be a doctor too, given his father's profession, but the business card he handed over told a different story. It was then that Gary humbly revealed the truth to my stunned sister and James. Not every doctor's son follows in his footsteps. And this company, he gestured to the business card, is a well-known pharmaceutical company recently passed down to me from my grandfather. My sister was at a loss for words, and James, realizing the gravity of the situation, attempted to sit up straighter, both of them turning pale as the significance of Gary's identity sank in. Gary continued, calmly disclosing how he knew of their past mistreatment towards me, stating that their behavior was far worse than he had imagined. James tried to muster an explanation, his face ashen, but Gary, with a stern look, silenced him. There's no excuse for such behavior. I'll be informing my father of this, Gary warned, leaving James to contemplate the repercussions of his actions. As we turned to leave, James was visibly shaken, and my sister stood frozen, still trying to process the sudden turn of events. Walking away from them, I felt a sense of closure, knowing that the truth had finally come to light, 
and the respect and integrity Gary carried with him had revealed the true character of those who had wronged me. Leaving my sister and her husband behind, I felt a chapter of my life closing. I couldn't help but wonder what became of them after that confrontation. James faced consequences at work for his poor attitude towards colleagues and patients alike. His salary was cut, and he was demoted, leading to a swift exit from the hospital as gossip about his behavior made rounds. Struggling to secure a new position, his life became markedly more difficult. My sister, on the other hand, had always lived beyond her means, relying on James's income which was never enough to satisfy her spending habits. James's financial downturn and subsequent weight loss were a stark testament to their dire situation. Quickly losing interest in him after his demotion, she divorced James, convinced she could easily move on to someone else. However, the reality was far from what she had envisioned. No longer the young, charming girl, her harsher demeanor had become evident, diminishing her appeal and leaving her lamenting her lack of suitors. She sought solace and sympathy from our parents, bemoaning her sudden lack of attention and even envying my life. Hinting at a deep-seated rivalry and admiration she might have felt towards me all along. Despite her cries for help, our parents stood firm, advising her to face the consequences of her actions, leading her into an uncertain future away from our family's support. As for me, distanced from the tumultuous relationship with my sister and her husband, I found solace in a peaceful, fulfilling life with Gary. Together, we looked forward to welcoming a new member to our family, a beacon of hope and joy amidst the remnants of past conflicts. As I caressed my growing belly, I couldn't help but feel grateful for the tranquility and love that surrounded me, a stark contrast to the turmoil that once defined my relationships with those closest to me. My husband Larry will inherit the house, the five million dollars, and the director position. When Julie heard a lawyer was there for Kyle's inheritance proceedings, she couldn't hide her joy. She walked into the living room like she owned the place. Julie, who always asked about the inheritance, and if it was done yet, must have been eagerly waiting for this day. Ignoring me, she went straight to the lawyer. The old me would have told her off, but as Julie turned her back to me, I couldn't wait to hear what she'd say next. Her greedy comments were even worse than I expected, and I laughed out loud, holding my stomach. The lawyer looked stunned, and I kept laughing at Julie's boldness. Julie didn't think it was funny and gave me a cold look. Do you really think you'll get your father-in-law's inheritance? I laughed at her obsession with money and her dramatic attitude. Pointing to the late-arriving Larry, she raised her voice. The right to inherit belongs to my husband Larry. I took a deep breath, ready to tell her the truth. My name is Lauren, and I am 62 years old. I have been a full-time housewife, supporting my doctor husband Kyle for a long time. Even after becoming a director, he always kept working, never tired. Larry grew up watching his father and decided to follow the same path. I believe my husband had a happy and fulfilling life. However, my husband passed away at the age of 65. He was passionate about his work and believed being a doctor was his calling. Maybe his sudden death was due to overworking, but at his funeral, I felt he had no regrets. Not just his superiors and colleagues, but also subordinates and others, came to the funeral. The venue was packed with people mourning him. It wasn't just medical professionals who attended. Many patients he had treated in the past came to pay their respects. I didn't know exactly how he worked since I only saw Kyle going to and from his job every day, but seeing how much he was loved reassured me that he had done the right things in his life. At the summer funeral, Julie, the eldest son's wife, seemed restless and out of place. Her face relaxed almost as if she was happy about her father-in-law's death. My suspicions were confirmed when I overheard her talking with relatives. My father-in-law was always working. I think he might have saved quite a lot since he probably didn't have much time to spend money, she said. Hearing such a statement right behind me, I couldn't believe my ears. Despite being in the middle of a funeral, 
Julie seemed more concerned about how her father-in-law's inheritance would be divided. Perhaps she didn't know that a daughter-in-law might not have any inheritance rights. Even so, her behavior wasn't appropriate for the funeral. Seeing her actions, Larry, the eldest son, apologized to me with a guilty look. Mom, I'm truly sorry. No matter how many times I tell her, Julie doesn't listen. It's not your fault, Larry. But if you feel that way, can you please firmly warn her? Many people are attending this event. I knew about Julie's behavior even before Larry mentioned it. Remembering her inexcusable attitude, I recalled how she didn't help at all while I was busy with my husband's funeral preparations. She didn't offer me any words of comfort or sympathy. To make matters worse, she was always talking about the money, asking things like, your husband had quite an inheritance, right? How much was it? Even if you're his wife, it's his inheritance, so don't waste it, okay? Did you come here just to say that? Is that all you have to say? Well, yeah, if you squander it just because you don't have long to live, I'll be in trouble. Anger and disbelief flooded over me as Julie spoke as if my late husband's assets belonged to her. Moreover, she always looked down on me and was sarcastic. I don't know why she dislikes me so much, but her comments about other people's assets have often left me disheartened. My son Larry was inspired by his father and became a doctor. Larry's earnings are not bad, but Julie has always been overly obsessed with money. She'd often call me saying things like, I'm worried about our future with Larry's low income, or we're short on money hinting that she wanted financial help. Because of this, getting along with her was very challenging. I used to let things slide, but now she's targeting my husband's inheritance, and I've reached my limit. Larry's income is really unstable, so we don't have much money to spend freely. We can't afford luxuries. Oh really? Why don't you work then? That would help with the household expenses, and you could afford some luxuries. What? It's ridiculous for a doctor's wife to work. You're lucky since your husband earned well, and you could live comfortably. No matter how many times I tried to advise her, her attitude only worsened, and our arguments became more heated. She wouldn't even hesitate to belittle her own husband, Larry, just to look down on me. From her perspective, I'm her mother-in-law, but once married, we're family. I couldn't stand the way she treated family members with such disrespect. Thanks to my husband, I've been able to live comfortably. If she wanted the same, maybe she should respect and support her husband a bit more. If there was something about Larry to respect, then maybe. Anyway, I'm off to get my nails done and have a spa day. Don't forget about the inheritance, okay? Bye now. She just blurted out whatever she wanted and promptly left the house. Given her stormy behavior, I began to wonder how Larry was treated at home. But her self-centered actions didn't end there. During the inheritance proceedings, she continued her bad behavior, which became increasingly intolerable. Even after the funeral was over, every time she visited, she'd greet me with, how's the inheritance coming along? It felt like a standard greeting. Despite explaining several times that the process takes time, she either forgets or doesn't understand and constantly pressures me whenever she sees me. I've told her multiple times that she has no rights to the inheritance, but she just doesn't seem to get it. Whether she believes Larry's money is hers or has some other scheme in mind, she seems convinced she'll inherit a fortune. After discussing with Larry, or rather manipulating the conversation to her advantage, she probably intends to get a share of the inheritance. If that was all, it would be a family matter for Larry to handle. But her actions affect everyone involved, making the situation much more complicated and stressful. I shouldn't interfere, but Julie tried to steal valuable things from our house. Julie, what are you doing? That's my necklace. Oh, come on, don't be so stingy. We're family, so it's okay, right? I can't be friends with someone who would steal from me. Fine then, I'll take it as an advance on the inheritance. That's okay, right? I am being patient here. No matter how many times I told her not to act like that, she wouldn't listen to me. From the moment, 
She took my cherished necklace, a gift for my husband, I couldn't stand it. After that, I never opened the door for her again. Even though Larry frequently messaged saying, Mom, I'm truly sorry for Julie, he couldn't stop her. I gave up expecting anything from Larry or Julie. I didn't even have time to grieve the loss of the necklace as her harassment continued. She badmouthed me to her friends and others, calling me the worst mother-in-law who won't even let her in the house. The neighbors would say, it looks tough, with a smile, but they showed concern. I don't understand why she hates me so much, it gives me a headache. What hurt the most was a letter I found in our mailbox. I felt disgusted just by seeing the already opened envelope. When I checked its contents, it was addressed to Larry and his wife. Whether it's Julie's idea of harassment because I won't let her in, her credit card bill was in our mailbox. Seeing the statement filled with extravagant expenses from luxury restaurants and online shopping made my blood run cold. Larry, there's a credit card bill for Julie in our mailbox. It was already opened and checked. What's the meaning of this? Huh? I have no idea. It seems like she has spent a lot. She always talks about her income to me. Is everything okay? Well, um, it's actually tough. Mom, I'm sorry to ask, but could you pay it for us? Wanting to complain, I contacted Larry. However, whether under Julie's influence or due to the power dynamics in his household, he said something unbelievable, leaving me speechless. I wondered why I needed to help them. Why would he even think I'd assist them? He can even retrieve the cherished necklace from his wife. What is he even saying? I also harshly criticized his behavior, which seemed to only remember things convenient for him. I've already done my part in supporting you as a parent. Why would an adult like you burden their parent and ask for help? Well, we have dad's inheritance, right? You won't be able to use it all by yourself. Please, I thought you'd help. There's a saying about a thief acting brazenly after committing theft, and now I get it. Larry, you and Julie are really a match made in heaven. I'm cutting ties. Stay away from me. I could tell from the other end of the phone that he wasn't taking what I was saying seriously. I was so furious with his attitude. After hanging up, I immediately threw the bill into the trash. The idea that Julie might have deliberately put it in our mailbox, assuming I'd pay, was unbelievable. Most of all, it was an inconceivable act and made me question her as a person. Do you think I haven't thought about it? Is there really a way to get the inheritance? Kyle, what should I do? I asked my husband's photo, picking it up unconsciously. From my anger and disappointment towards Larry and Julie, I've lost understanding of how to handle my emotions. Is it really okay to proceed with the inheritance as it is? Amidst my insecurities, I somehow gathered courage. I hope someday they get what they deserve. Frustrated by their appalling behavior, I dealt with the inheritance proceedings alone. Perhaps my feelings got through, as I found out my husband had left a will, and in it, something was written. After reading the will my husband left behind, I resolved to protect myself and get back at them. Phew, I'm glad it seems Kyle was on my side after all. Thank you, I whispered, holding back tears and pressing the will to my chest. I regained my composure. I clenched my fist, deciding I wouldn't just do nothing and let those two dictate things. I decided to wait for the right moment to make a big move against them. Maybe because I felt relieved at the thought of being able to retaliate for all the suffering, I completely forgot about Julie's bill. I would have thrown it away from the start not intending to pay, but she must have received a reminder. This time, I received a message from her, even though I had told her the inheritance proceedings were not yet completed. There were false accusations that I wanted to control everything. Her words seemed to attack me. It's because you haven't settled the inheritance yet. I'll wait a little longer, but please do it as soon as possible. Oh, by the way, you saw the bill I left in the mailbox, right? Please make that payment. What are you talking about? Stop joking. Why do you think you're entitled to the inheritance? 
Oh, come on, Larry is the eldest son, right? It's only natural for him to get an inheritance, isn't it? Do they think I know nothing? Julie scoffed and said with a smirk, Larry has a right to inherit because he's the eldest son. In general, this is not incorrect. Even after Julie said all this, I still haven't told them the important thing. Even if I don't tell them, it's their own problem, and they should naturally know about it. But for them, who only think conveniently, it might be hard to realize. I'm waiting for the perfect moment when they fall apart, watching for the right timing. And finally, that time came. It was when I had explained the situation to the lawyer, and after the proceedings were finished with his cooperation, I finalized the plan. I will contact Larry when the procedure is complete. After discussing with the lawyer, to me it's just a routine communication. But as expected, Julie came to my house with a face filled with joy. I deliberately left the front door unlocked. Without any suspicion, she opened the door and stomped in. Seeing her, I could hardly hold back my laughter. I've been waiting for so long. Isn't it terrible? You've been reluctant to complete the procedure and won't give up the inheritance. Oh, Julie, what brings you here? Is this gentleman the lawyer? I am July, Larry's wife. Ignoring me completely, she headed straight to the lawyer sitting in front of me. Normally, I would reprimand her for such rude behavior, but this time I held back and waited. She turned her back on me, ignoring me, and approached the lawyer. I was excited to hear what she would say next. Finally, we will inherit this house, $5 million, and the director's position because Larry is the eldest son, she said. Her greedy remark was more than I expected, and I laughed out loud, holding my stomach. The audacity of her and the lawyer's stunned face made it even funnier, and I kept laughing. Of course, Julie didn't find the situation amusing and glared at me coldly. Hey, what's so funny? Are you upset that we are taking the inheritance? No, why? Five million? How did you come up with that amount? Come on, your husband worked as a doctor for a long time, right? He probably didn't have time to spend money. It's obvious that there's that much money. Unless, have you already used it? I genuinely laughed at her obsession with money. Whatever I choose to do with my inheritance is my business and you have no right to complain. However, it seems she doesn't like the idea of me inheriting. How many times have I told you, since you don't have much longer to live, don't do anything reckless? Even if you're related by marriage, it's quite something to say that to me, your elder. Didn't I tell you that you have no right to inherit? Julie, wearing the necklace she stole from me, glared at me sharply. I have no intention of letting her take anything more precious from me. I made up my mind not to lose to her, who is self-centered, greedy, and obsessed with money. I clenched my fist. Pointing to the late-arriving Larry, Julie exclaimed loudly, The right to inherit belongs to my husband Larry. Taking a deep breath, I decided to tell them the truth. You see, there shouldn't be any inheritance for you two to claim. Larry isn't that right. Huh? Why, Mom? What do you mean? Oh, don't you have any idea? Aren't you forgetting something? Wait, are you talking about that issue? It was resolved a long time ago, wasn't it? Duh, what are you even talking about? Truly disappointing. What have you made amends for? What's resolved? Don't talk nonsense. Wait a minute, what are you talking about? I was taken aback by her demeanor as if she had completely forgotten or knew nothing about the issue, even though it was a situation she caused. It seemed she couldn't remember it. I decided to explain the situation in detail for them to understand. Larry had married Julie a few years back. However, before that, he was already married to another woman and had a child with her. Despite having a family, he neglected them to have an affair with Julie. After their affair, Larry and Julie got married. The truth came out when Larry came begging Kyle, unable to pay a lemony and child support on his own. Larry, what were you thinking? I never thought you would stoop this low. I had no other choice if I wanted to marry Julie. What are you saying? You're the one who committed the wrongdoing. Even if you are my son, 
Don't expect me to pay for your mistakes. Larry, take responsibility and sort it out. Why, you can help me a bit. As a doctor, you are constantly working and don't have time to spend money, so you must have some to spare, right? Larry's audacious remark pushed my husband's anger to its peak. When Larry started making excuses about being overwhelmed with newly of life and needing money for their wedding, my husband decided to cast aside his feelings as a parent and choose his grandchild instead. Fine, I'll pay on your behalf. There's no need for my grandchild to suffer because of a terrible father like you. Dad, don't say it in such a sarcastic way. I'm your son, you know. Exactly, that's the point. And in exchange, I won't support you in any way from now on. And of course, don't expect to inherit a single thing from me. Larry probably thought that my husband's words were just declarations made in the heat of the moment. But my husband believed that someone who abandons their family doesn't deserve to be celebrated. He neither attended the wedding nor offered any support. Dad, just let it go. In the future, you'll rely on us for care, right? We are family, so try to compromise a bit. No way. Why would I bother with someone like you? Knowing that his father had money, Larry had previously mentioned the need for future care and requested support. However, my husband didn't listen to Larry's words, and as he declared, he made sure it was written in his will. It clearly stated that everything should go to his wife and grandchild. My husband, with his strict personality, had meticulously written and prepared the will to ensure that not even a small amount of money would go to Larry and his wife. This fact became known when my husband's lawyer showed the will during the funeral proceedings. He said he had received the will from my husband in advance. Remembering the anger at that time brings up emotions, but I deeply thanked my husband for his foresight and protection. My husband left a will stating that even though Larry is his son, he does not have the right to inherit his father's estate. When the lawyer read the contents of the will, Larry and Julie were shocked. I decided to add insult to injury. Oh, by the way, Julie, you took things from our house, right? You said it was like an advance on the inheritance. But you heard the will the lawyer read, right? You have no rights, so give it back. It was a gift from my husband to me. I pointed to the necklace she was wearing. She threw the necklace at me with a visibly angry attitude, clicking her tongue and glaring at me. Probably because the lawyer was present, she couldn't say anything reckless. I didn't hear about this. I thought I'd finally get my father-in-law's inheritance. I came all the way here today. What's going on? Really? When you announced your marriage, you said being pursued meant you were more attractive, so it was inevitable, right? You knew what you were getting into when you got with him while he already had a family. I remembered how furious I was at her attitude back then. I used to think Larry was deceived by such a terrible woman but now I realize they are a perfectly matched couple. I will definitely inherit. Oh, there is the hospital. It would be troublesome if the director was absent, right? This kind of succession is usually done by the son. Too bad, it's already been handed over to a competent subordinate. Huh? Why? Isn't it normal for the son to take over? Ha ha ha, to begin with, you're doing something that's not normal, right? It's your own doing. Realize that you're not the norm. She was desperate for the inheritance, whether it be the hospital or the house. In the end, she clung to the lawyer, asking, then what can I get? But the lawyer my husband had contracted wouldn't easily tell her. He repeatedly explained the contents of the will, stating, the two of you have no inheritance rights, and responded calmly. This is unbelievable. I don't believe it it must be a mistake. Really, no matter how much you fuss, nothing will change. Even if you sue, you'll just end up embarrassed. If you're okay with that, feel free to do so. Perhaps finding my cold treatment unbearable, she stormed out of the house with a face as red as a boiled octopus. I watched her leave with Larry. I held the necklace and quietly pumped my fist in triumph. After that, she never contacted me or visited the house again, and the inheritance procedures were completed smoothly. 
I was worried they would confront Larry's ex-wife who has a grandchild, but Larry, who doesn't even pay child support, wouldn't know her contact details, so there were no issues. Larry and Julie, who didn't get any inheritance, seemed to be having a big quarrel. Julie told Larry, I married you thinking I would get a big inheritance from your father, and they are apparently on the brink of divorce. The saying, end of money, end of love, fits them perfectly. I only received one contact from Larry, saying, give me the money or house you inherited, but I naturally ignored it. I exclaimed, don't talk nonsense while you're awake, and hung up the phone. I sighed, wondering where I went wrong raising my son, but there was also good news. A letter arrived from Larry's ex-wife, stating that the inheritance procedures were completed. In it, along with an update, there was a photo of my cute grandchild and words of gratitude. Thank you for being such wonderful grandparents, it said. They are living very happily now. The grandchild my husband had been concerned about until the end is growing up healthy and living happily with her new father. There was also a lovely family photo in the letter. And although I felt guilt as a parent, my mood was brightened and my heart warmed. I was very happy and immediately read the letter in front of my husband's altar to report to him. I was continuously disappointed by Larry's actions and words. However, I was able to report to my husband about the grandchild, which always brought a smile to his face, and I was happy and satisfied. My name is Emma, and I'm a 20-year-old university student living in New York. I grew up in a family that went through its share of changes. My parents got divorced when I was 14, and I've lived with my mom ever since. Things got even tougher last year when my dad, who I was very close to, passed away from cancer. He left me a significant amount of money in his will, but I could only access it when I turned 20. This year, I reached that milestone, and not long after, something pretty unbelievable happened. One afternoon, my stepdad, Justin, who is in his mid-thirties and has been married to my mom for the last six years, asked to talk to me. Our relationship has always been a bit strained. I try to keep things peaceful, but he's not always been the kindest to me. He started the conversation with a heavy topic. He suggested that I give the money my dad left me to my stepbrother, Michael, to help with his college expenses. According to Justin, Michael needed the money more for his education, and it seemed only fair to him that I help out. I was taken aback by his request. The idea of giving away the money my dad left for me felt wrong. I tried to explain to Justin that this inheritance was something my dad intended for me, and it felt important to keep it for my future. But Justin didn't see my point of view. He insisted that I didn't need the money and that Michael's needs were greater. Despite his pressure, I stood my ground. I calmly explained to Justin that saying no wasn't about disrespect. It was about honoring my dad's wishes and maintaining personal boundaries. Justin got quite upset at my refusal and tried to intimidate me, but I remained firm in my decision. It was a challenging conversation, but it was important for me to speak up for what I felt was right. I stood firm making it clear that if Justin was upset by my refusal, he might want to reconsider his approach. Justin, remember, you're part of this household too, so let's try to keep things respectful, I suggested. But it seemed like a peaceful resolution wasn't in the cards. I ended the conversation there, leaving before he had the chance to respond. Justin's reaction wasn't a shock to me, given his past behavior. I had a hunch he might try to claim the inheritance money for himself at some point. You might wonder about my mom's role in all of this. Well, that's a complex issue. My mom, for reasons I can't fully understand, always seems to overlook Justin's negative traits. She's deeply in love with him, almost to the point of blindness, and I didn't want to shatter her perception by constantly clashing with Justin. So I've tried to maintain peace for her sake. It's odd, considering I'm one of the youngest in the house, yet often I find myself having to be the most responsible. At the time of this ordeal, my mom, Mary, was out of town, which is why she wasn't around to intervene. Had she been there, she would have been livid. 
Justin knew he had a window of opportunity with her away, underestimating my resolve in the process. As I walked away from our heated discussion, Justin followed, berating me and labeling me a terrible sister for not wanting to hand over the inheritance to Michael. But it wasn't about not wanting to help, it was about the principle of the matter. Justin and Michael, unfortunately, seemed to follow the like father, like son trope, acting more like schemers from a cartoon than family members. Their antics could remind someone of the characters Pinky and the Brain, with their roles in this scenario up for debate. As I tried to leave the argument behind, Justin wasn't done. He insisted I listen and comply with his demands, bringing Michael into the conversation to reinforce his point. Michael sleepily joined in, confused about the details until Justin prompted him about the important reason behind their demand for the money, a supposed business venture that suddenly became about Michael's university tuition. Their story was inconsistent, with Justin scrambling to justify their claim to my inheritance, first mentioning a business, then switching to tuition. It was clear their motives were murky at best, relying on manipulation rather than any real need or right to the money my dad left me. I just woke up, so I'm a bit foggy, Michael mumbled, trying to piece together his story. Right, the university. I've been thinking about going, and I need the money for that. So yeah, I need it. His attempt to claim the inheritance for his education was unconvincing at best. I couldn't help but respond with a firm no, prompting a flurry of protests from both him and Justin. Why not Emma? He's clear about what he wants, Justin pressed, insisting the matter was non-negotiable and that they were entitled to the money. We'll just have to see about that, I replied, the air growing thick with tension. Justin's antics were usually limited to harmless pranks, but this new scheme to manipulate me out of my inheritance marked a departure into outright selfishness and immaturity. I decided to hold off on telling my mom for the time being, preferring to handle the situation on my own, especially after uncovering more about their dubious intentions. Emma, stop being childish. It's time to act like an adult and do what's right, Justin lectured, suggesting that the adult thing to do was to hand over my inheritance. His logic was baffling. And what, Justin? The right thing is to give away my inheritance on your say-so? I countered. His plea to keep this from my mom raised my suspicions further. Why shouldn't I tell her? She has every right to know what's happening in her own house. Justin's desperation not to involve my mom, paired with his uncharacteristically stern tone, only fueled my resolve. Something was definitely amiss particularly with the so-called business venture Michael had mentioned earlier. It was clear they underestimated my awareness of their tactics, and Justin's vehement opposition to me sharing anything with my mom was a red flag. I reached out to my mom at the first opportunity. Hey mom, how's everything with you? I began trying to gauge her mood. I'm all right, dear. What about you? She responded. I hesitated, knowing what I was about to divulge could cause a stir. Not great, Mom. Something's up with Justin and Michael Justin in particular. He's been acting really strange. My mom's response was to caution me against overthinking things. Oh, Emma, don't let your imagination get the better of you. But it was too late for reassurances. The pieces were too aligned, pointing to something more than just a misunderstanding or paranoia on my part. Understanding my mom's reluctance to believe the unsettling truth about Justin, I pressed on, determined to shed light on the situation. Mom, I get that you have feelings for him, but Justin crossed a line. He didn't just ask for the inheritance money, he demanded it for Michael, claiming it was for education purposes. There's something off about this whole thing, and he even became aggressive when I mentioned bringing it up to you, I explained my resolve hardening despite her skepticism. My mom hesitated, torn by her emotions and the troubling accusations against the man she cared for. I'm struggling to grasp this, Emma. I feel like we need more evidence to make sense of it all. Don't worry, mom. I'll find the proof we need, I assured her, 
even though she wasn't entirely convinced. The idea that Justin had somehow bewitched her with his manipulations nagged at me, but I knew I needed solid evidence to reveal the true nature of his intentions. Later that night, I found myself scoring the family computer for any clues that could unravel the mystery of Justin's behavior. Fortune seemed to be on my side when I discovered that Justin had carelessly left his email account open. What I found was a revelation. Emails exchanged between Justin and a woman named Martha painted a clear picture of deceit. These messages were far from innocent, hinting strongly at an affair. But it was the content discussing plans for a divorce and a future together, fueled by an influx of money from a dubious business venture, that caught my attention. Justin may have been cautious not to detail any illegal activities, but his indiscretion and betrayal were blatant. Armed with this information and determined to uncover more, I decided to approach Michael, hoping he might inadvertently reveal more about their plans. I initiated a casual conversation with him, subtly turning on my phone's recorder to capture our exchange. Hey, Michael, I greeted him, feigning cheerfulness. Hello, Emma, he replied, seemingly in a good mood. You seem happy today. Why not? It's a beautiful day, I said, steering the conversation in hopes of discovering more about Justin's schemes and their impact on my family. I approached Michael with a sense of curiosity, pretending to consider their request for the inheritance money. I've been thinking a lot about what you and Justin mentioned. I'm actually considering giving you the money for your college, I told him, watching his reaction closely. Really? That's amazing. I'll let him know right away, Michael said, his excitement palpable. Hold on, not so quickly. Before anything happens, I need to confirm something. This money is specifically for your college tuition, correct? I pressed on, trying to gauge his sincerity. Yes, of course, for my college tuition, Michael stuttered a bit, perhaps caught off guard by my questioning. And you're sure about this? What about Martha? Is she serious about it too? I prodded, dropping the name I had discovered in Justin's emails. Martha? Who's Martha? Michael faltered, a clear sign of confusion crossing his face. Oh, she's, uh, a student advisor at the college. He quickly covered up, but it was too late. Unbeknownst to us, Justin had silently entered the room, and his presence was intimidating. I don't appreciate you questioning my son like this, he interjected, his tone stern. I was merely inquiring about the intended use of my inheritance. After all, if I'm considering giving it away, I'd like to know it's for a good reason, I explained, trying to maintain my composure. Justin's retort was sharp. Once you give money away, it's no longer yours to worry about. It's not your business anymore. The audacity of his statement took me aback, especially considering his next threat. You're not just thinking about giving us the money. You will give it to us, or you'll find yourself out of this house. Michael looked as shocked as I felt by his father's escalation. Dad, this isn't what we agreed on, he began, only to be cut off by Justin asserting his authority in a domineering tone, threatening my place in the home if I didn't comply with his demands. Choosing silence as my response, I retreated to my room, all the while recording the entire confrontation. Justin was unaware that his true colors were being captured for posterity. Once safe in my room, I began compiling all the evidence I had against him. It felt like I was a detective in one of those crime shows, piecing together the puzzle. I had audio recordings and email screenshots, all pointing to Justin's deceitful behavior and his affair with Martha. Feeling the weight of my findings, I decided it was time to bring my mom into the loop. Hello, mom, I started, my voice laced with urgency. Hey, sweetheart, how are you? She responded, unaware of the storm brewing. Mom, are you sitting down? I have something important to tell you, and it's not easy, I said, preparing her for the revelations that were to come. Breaking the news to my mom was tough. I started by telling her about the unsettling discoveries I had made. Initially, she found it hard to believe, 
but when I played the audio recording of my conversation with Justin, her denial began to fade, replaced by a mixture of shock and heartbreak. Why would he do such things? Why be so cruel? She questioned, her voice breaking with every word. It's hard to say, but we're dealing with someone who doesn't have our best interests at heart. I replied gently, trying to be as supportive as I could despite the harsh reality. I hate to say it, but he's not the person we thought he was. Hearing the truth straight from the recording was a turning point for her. This is unacceptable. I can't believe I wasn't here to protect you from them, she said, determination taking over her initial shock. Stay put. I'm coming back immediately, and yes, I've locked my door, I reassured her. My mom's protective instincts kicked in full force. She was ready to confront Justin and ensure he regretted his actions. He's going to realize he picked the wrong family to mess with, she said, a fierce resolve in her voice. When she arrived, it was a moment filled with mixed emotions. We hugged tightly, sharing tears over the betrayal and the tough decisions that lay ahead. Yet, there was also a sense of relief and unity. Together, we spent hours devising a plan, ready to face the ordeal as a team. In the days that followed, Justin was perplexed by my mom's unexpected return and her cold demeanor towards him. He tried to play it off with a veneer of cheerfulness, likely hoping to charm his way out of any suspicions. But my mom was unmoved. She saw right through his act and was gearing up to take decisive action. Concerned about the true nature of Justin's business and the potential misuse of the inheritance, my mom decided it was time to bring in professional help. She hired a private investigator to dig deeper into Justin's activities and the mysterious emails. The thought of him planning to misuse the money for unethical purposes infuriated her further and she was adamant about protecting us from his deceit. The private investigator's findings confirmed our worst fears and shed new light on Justin's scheming. My mom briefed me on the details, and together, we prepared for the next steps. It was clear that this was more than just a family dispute. It was about standing up against manipulation and ensuring justice was served. In that moment, the atmosphere in the room was charged with tension a palpable mix of disbelief and resolve hanging between us. Justin's usual confidence seemed to falter under the weight of our accusations, his eyes darting from the camera to my mom, then to me, as if searching for some escape or loophole in our confrontation. You can't possibly understand what you're talking about. This is ridiculous, Justin tried to deflect, but his voice lacked its usual assertiveness. It was clear the tables had turned and the power he once wielded so effortlessly was slipping through his fingers. Michael, caught in the middle of this familial storm, looked from his father to us, his expression a mix of confusion and realization. Perhaps for the first time, he began to see the man he called father for who he truly was a revelation that seemed to shake him to his core. My mom, with a steely gaze fixed on Justin, stepped forward. Not only do we understand, but we have proof. Emails, recordings. You've been planning to launder money through a laundromat, all the while involving yourself with a known criminal. Martha's record speaks volumes, and your plans for this business are clear as day. Justin's attempts to maintain any semblance of innocence were crumbling fast. You have no idea what you're getting into. This is my business, my life. You can't just barge in and but we can, and we are, I interjected, bolstering my mom's stance. This isn't just about your business, Justin. This is about our lives, our safety. You've brought danger and illegality into our home, and we won't stand by and watch you destroy everything for your selfish gains. The evidence was indisputable. The audio recordings of Justin's and Michael's conversations, the emails outlining their plans, and now they're caught in the act admissions made it impossible for Justin to deny any longer. The camera in my hands, still rolling, captured every word, every denial, and every excuse, ensuring there was no way out for him. You think you're clever, recording this, gathering evidence? Justin sneered, 
his composure cracking further. You may think you've won, but we don't think we've won, Justin. We know we have. My mom cut him off, her voice firm and unwavering. What you've done is not only morally reprehensible, but illegal. You've endangered this family, exploited my trust, and now you're going to face the consequences of your actions. As the confrontation reached its climax, Michael finally spoke up, his voice barely above a whisper, Dad, how could you? It was a question loaded with betrayal and disillusionment, aimed at the man he had looked up to. The room fell silent for a moment, the gravity of the situation settling in. Justin, now devoid of his usual bravado, seemed to shrink before us. It was clear the game was over. My mom's next steps were clear legal action, separation, and ensuring the safety and security of our family. As we left Justin to contemplate the ruin of his own making, my mom and I knew the road ahead would be difficult. But with the truth on our side and the evidence in hand, we were ready to face whatever came next, together. The veil had indeed been lifted, and in its place, a newfound strength and unity emerged between us, ready to rebuild and move forward from the shadows of deceit. I'm clueless about what you're hinting at. Why don't we call Martha? Maybe she can shed some light on this, huh? Justin tried to deflect, with a tone that barely masked his panic. You two think you've got it all figured out. Martha is just a friend, he added, but the confidence he attempted to project was waning rapidly. The compromising pictures we found tell a different story. I countered, my voice steady despite the tumult of emotions inside me. And seriously, who uses email for affairs these days? It's absurdly reckless. Justin, now visibly flustered, shot back, you went through my personal stuff. That's outrageous. No, Justin. What's outrageous is you, my mom interjected, her voice rising in indignation. How dare you repeatedly threaten my daughter over money that rightfully belongs to her? How dare you use threats to attempt to evict her from her own home? Your actions are indefensible. How dare you involve your son in your reckless plans, putting him at risk? And your audacity to plan using that money for illegal ventures is beyond forgiveness. Now, when it's time to account for your actions, you suddenly fall silent? She continued, her words cutting through the air like a blade. Justin, cornered and desperate, spat out, get that camera out of my face, as he lunged towards me in a blind rage. I dodged his attempt swiftly, his aggressive move only adding to the gravity of his unraveling. You're thinking of attacking my daughter now? Do you have any idea how much trouble you're in? My mom exclaimed, her tone a mix of disbelief and anger. Justin, defiant to the end, sneered, you think you understand the situation? You know nothing. Well, let's see if the police agree with you. They should be arriving any minute now, I declared, watching closely for his reaction. Police, you wouldn't dare, he blustered, but his bravado was crumbling. As the sound of police sirens grew closer, Justin's usual smugness disappeared, replaced by a look of sheer terror. It was the first time I'd seen him stripped of his arrogance, revealing the coward beneath. Please, Mary, let's not escalate this. I can explain, he pleaded, his voice cracking under the strain. Save your explanations for the judge, you despicable man, my mom retorted with a disgust that left no room for ambiguity. And Michael, don't think you're absolved from responsibility. You're both going to face the consequences of your actions. As the police arrived, it was clear that this was the beginning of the end for Justin's schemes. My mom's fierce declaration echoed in the air, marking a pivotal moment of justice for us. This should teach you a lesson about disrespecting my daughter and me. You're not too young to understand the difference between right and wrong, and it's time for you to face the consequences, my mom asserted, her tone firm but fair. Yes, mom, I understand. I replied, knowing that I had crossed a line and needed to accept the repercussions of my actions. Come on, Grace, don't you think this is all a bit too extreme? Justin tried to argue, seeking some leniency. Quite the opposite. 
This is barely scratching the surface of what's deserved, my mom countered, her resolve unwavering. Emma, how's our live stream doing? My mom inquired, a modern twist to ensuring that justice was seen to be done. We've got over 5,000 viewers tuning in. This is making waves, I informed her, amazed at the digital audience we had attracted. And just to make things perfectly clear, my mom turned towards Justin, her voice steady and clear, I want a divorce. Yes, you heard it right, folks, she announced, making sure the live stream caught every word. The fallout from the live stream was monumental. The drama unfolded in real time for over 5,000 witnesses, and the story quickly spread to local newspapers and tabloids. Being at the center of this whirlwind was surreal, witnessing the swift downfall of Justin, my soon-to-be ex-stepfather, and the complicit Michael. The satisfaction of seeing justice served was palpable. Justin's world unraveled as he lost his job, friends, and even the support of some family members who chose to distance themselves. Facing serious charges, Justin's future hung in the balance, with the potential of spending up to 22 years behind bars if the court found him guilty. Meanwhile, Martha, his partner in crime, was also discovered by the police after attempting to lay low during the scandal. She too faced similar charges, her future uncertain. Through the turmoil, my mom and I found strength in each other. Our bond deepened as we navigated through the chaos, coming out stronger on the other side. Weekends were now our time to unwind on the patio, drinks in hand, reflecting on the absurdity and malevolence of Justin's actions. It was a period of healing and reaffirmation for us both. Good riddance, we toast, a shared sentiment of relief and closure. Good riddance, indeed. My stepmother, Olivia, disliked me a lot. She saw me not as a stepson, but as an unwanted reminder of her husband's previous life. Filled with resentment, she secretly plotted with a rich woman who had moved in nearby. Their secret plan was to sell me along with the farm, cutting all her ties to my existence. However, Fake had different ideas, and a surprising turn of events changed everything, leading to a series of unforeseen events that altered my life forever. Hello, my name is Jack, and I'm going to share a story that weaves through deep deception and paths of redemption. My story starts in the small town of Bern, Switzerland, where I lived on a large chicken farm. To an outsider, it might have looked charming, but for me, it was a battlefield. I was just 12 years old but life had already forced me to take on the responsibilities of an adult. My mother died when I was born, an event that shaped my whole life. My father, overwhelmed with sadness and alcohol, found comfort in drinking rather than in being there for the son who needed him. Not long after, he brought Olivia into our lives. To her, I was merely a living reminder of a past she wanted to forget. Our home, if you could call it that, was sustained by the little money we made from our chicken farm. We sold eggs and chickens to make ends meet, but often, my father wasted our earnings at Joe's Tavern, leaving us on the edge of poverty. Every morning, as the sun cast long shadows over the dewy fields, I would be out feeding the chickens and collecting eggs while the rest of the world was still asleep. My small hands, rough and calloused, carried the weight of a life I never chose. School became a distant memory, a place for other children, not for someone who had to keep a farm running. But our story takes a darker turn the day Olivia's true nature came to light. I remember overhearing her one chilly morning. Her voice was sharp and secretive as she talked to someone on the phone about a solution to her problems. I didn't understand it then, but I felt a chill that wasn't from the cold. That's when Mrs. Patrick entered our lives. A widow, rich and mysterious, she had recently moved into a large estate near our farm. Her arrival was the talk of the town, but for Olivia, it was an opportunity. I later learned that Olivia saw a chance to get rid of me by making a deal with Mrs. Patrick. I first met Mrs. Patrick one evening when the sky was painted with streaks of crimson and purple. She came to our farm pretending to be interested in buying it. Her eyes, sharp and assessing, seemed to see more than what was obvious. There was a kindness in her manner, but her presence made me feel uneasy. Jack, show Mrs. Patrick around the farm. Olivia ordered, her voice dripping with a sweetness that didn't reach her eyes. As I led Mrs. Patrick around, showing her the coops and the feed sheds, 
Her questions dug deeper than I expected. You manage all this on your own, Jack, she asked, her voice tinged with something I couldn't quite place. Was it concern or curiosity? Yes, ma'am, it's a lot of work, but I manage, I replied. I replied, trying to hide the tiredness in my voice as clear as the dirt on my boots. Mrs. Patrick looked at me a bit longer than needed, her eyes full of deep thoughts. As we walked back to the house, the setting sun stretched long shadows across the path, making it look eerie and twisted. That night, as I lay in bed listening to the distant call of an owl, I overheard Olivia speaking quietly with my father. They were planning something big, something that would change everything. The bits of conversation I caught were enough to make me panic. We'll be free of the burden, Olivia said eagerly, once she takes the farm, and him. Their laughter, cold and cruel, reached up to my small attic room. I lay there, crushed by the weight of their plans. What did they mean? Was I the burden they wanted to be free of? Question after question raced through my mind, each more disturbing than the last. As dawn broke the next day, I woke up with a determination I had never felt before. I knew I needed to find out what was being planned behind closed doors. Little did I know, the answers would completely shake my world. It started like any other day on the farm, with the roosters crowing and the chickens bustling about, unaware of the human schemes unfolding around them. But today, I was not just feeding them. I was also watching and listening for any clue of what might happen next. After my usual morning chores, I quietly made my way back to the house. The front door was slightly open a careless mistake, or maybe a chance I needed. I pressed my ear to the gap and listened. Inside, Olivia and my father were speaking in low, urgent voices with Mrs. Patrick, who had come back pretending to finalize the sale of the farm. We appreciate your generous offer, Mrs. Patrick, my father said, his words slurred and smelling of last night's alcohol. We're ready to move forward. This place and the boy, it's all too much for us now. Mrs. Patrick's voice was smooth like honey, but with a sharp edge that made me shiver. I understand your situation, and I assure you I can take care of everything. The farm will be in good hands, and so will Jack. The way she said my name sent a shiver down my spine. Was she just another bad person in this plot, or was there something more? Determined to find answers, I took a risk later that day while Olivia was in town and my father was sleeping off another drinking session. I approached Mrs. Patrick as she was checking the farm's borders. Mrs. Patrick, I began, my voice steadier than I felt. Why do you want to buy our farm, and why are you interested in me? She looked at me closely for a long moment, her eyes searching mine. Then, to my surprise, she sighed. Jack, sometimes adults have to make tough choices, but I promise, whatever happens, I'll make sure you're safe. Her words confused me. They seemed kind, but I was still unsure about her true intentions. Over the next few days, things at home got tense. Olivia's looks were sharp and calculating, and my father avoided my eyes, his usual indifference replaced by a hint of guilt. They were planning to leave. One night, I heard them talking about a new life, one without the farm and without me. The day before everything was to be finalized with Mrs. Patrick, I decided to confront Olivia. I found her in the kitchen, packing dishes with more care than she had ever shown me. Olivia, I said, my voice cracking with a mix of fear and anger, what's going to happen to me? She stopped and turned slowly, her expression cold. Jack, you're going to a better place. Mrs. Patrick will take good care of you, better than we ever could. But I don't want to leave, I protested, my voice rising. Olivia's expression hardened. It's not about what you want, Jack. It's for the best. That night, unable to sleep, I lay in bed listening to the whispers of the wind through the cracked window, my heart heavy, my future uncertain. The next morning, Mrs. Patrick would return to our farm to finalize the sale, and supposedly, my fate. As dawn crept over the horizon, casting long shadows across the fields, I made a decision. I couldn't just wait to see what would happen to me. Mrs. Patrick stepped forward, addressing the officers with a clear and firm tone. There seems to be some misunderstanding here. I have not agreed to take Jack permanently. I was approached by these two about buying the farm and possibly providing Jack with temporary guardianship while they sort out their issues. The officers listened intently, taking notes. One of them turned to me, his voice kind but probing. 
Jack, have they discussed with you any details about moving or living arrangements other than what you've just mentioned? I shook my head, the weight of the unknown pressing down on me. No, sir. They just told me I'd be staying with Mrs. Patrick for a while because it's too hard for them now. The officer nodded, then focused on Olivia and my father. We need to investigate these claims thoroughly. It's important that any decision about Jack's welfare follows legal procedures and is made in his best interest. Olivia looked visibly shaken, her voice barely a whisper as she tried to explain. We just thought it would be better for Jack. We can't provide for him the way he needs. The atmosphere was tense, each person's anxiety palpable. Mrs. Patrick then addressed me directly, her gaze softening. Jack, regardless of what happens, I want you to know that my offer to help is sincere. But any long-term decision will need to be properly vetted and approved. The officers then suggested they all go inside to discuss the matter further and check some paperwork. We also have a social worker who will need to speak with Jack and assess his living conditions, one officer added as they ushered the group towards the house. As they moved inside, I stood there for a moment, trying to process everything. The fear of the unknown mingled with a flicker of hope, knowing that these officers might just help me find a stable and caring environment. The future was still uncertain, but for the first time in a long while, I felt like there were adults around who might actually look out for my best interests. I never planned to take Jack away without his agreement or the proper legal steps. I was here to talk about buying the farm, but when I found out about the child's situation, I became worried. I contacted the police because I was concerned for his safety and well-being. The officers nodded and then turned their attention back to Olivia and my father. We need to check some documents and have a longer talk about Jack's custody and your financial actions, one officer said, gesturing for them to lead the way inside. As they walked into the house, Mrs. Patrick stayed back with me for a moment. Jack, no matter what happens today, I want you to know that my home is always open to you, and not because of any deal, but because you deserve a safe and loving place, she said. Her words felt like a warm blanket around my shivering shoulders. I nodded, not fully understanding the legal details, but feeling a spark of hope in the midst of the chaos. Inside, the officers started their questioning pulling out documents that Olivia and my father struggled to explain. It quickly became clear that there were mistakes and possibly fake information in the paperwork related to the farm sale. As the officers dug deeper, Olivia's cover finally fell apart. It was all his idea, she burst out, pointing a trembling finger at my father. He wanted to sell the farm and get rid of the kid. I just went along with it. My father, his face now showing despair, looked at me, his eyes finally meeting mine. Jack, I'm sorry. I thought it would be better for you. The room spun around me as accusations were made and confessions came out. The officers took notes, their faces serious. The betrayal hurt, but the truth coming out also brought a strange relief. Finally, the reality of my life was being acknowledged by those who could change it. As the morning turned into afternoon, decisions were made. Olivia and my father were taken into custody for further questioning, and I was left in the temporary care of Mrs. Patrick. As we left the farm, I looked back at the only home I'd ever known, feeling the weight of my past and the uncertain promise of my future. As we drove away from the farm, the landscape of my past turned into a blur of green and gray, a picture fading into the background of my new reality. Seated next to Mrs. Patrick in the warmth of her car, I started to feel a cautious hope for what lay ahead. For the first time in what felt like an eternity, I felt a true sense of safety a sanctuary from the chaos that had ensnared my life. Yet beneath this newfound security, my emotions churned, betrayal from those I had trusted, relief from the danger I was escaping, fear of the unknown ahead, and a budding hope kindled by Mrs. Patrick's words. Mrs. Patrick, sensing my tumultuous state, broke the silence as we drove. Jack. I know today has been extraordinarily difficult, and the days ahead will involve many changes, but remember, you're not alone anymore, she assured me, her voice a soothing balm to my frayed nerves. She revealed that she had been observing the farm for some time, suspecting that not all was as it seemed. Her intervention, she explained, wasn't solely about the property itself, but was driven by a concern for my well-being. As we arrived at her estate, I was struck by its grandeur. The house, large yet welcoming, 
was surrounded by lush gardens bursting with vibrant colors, a stark contrast to the drab existence I had known. The gardens, a riot of hues, seemed almost surreal in their beauty, providing a visual feast that lifted my spirits. Over the subsequent days, Mrs. Patrick took the necessary legal steps to stabilize my situation. She was appointed my temporary guardian, and the process to officially make her my foster parent was initiated. During this period, I came to learn more about her. Unable to have children of her own, and having lost her husband a few years prior, she lived in a large estate that seemed too quiet for just one person. It was clear her heart had ample room for more. One sunny afternoon, as we meandered through her rose garden, the air fragrant with the scent of blooms, Mrs. Patrick paused and faced me. Her expression was earnest. Jack, I want you to understand that you are not a replacement or a charity case, she began, her voice firm yet kind. You are a brave young boy who deserves a chance at happiness. I hope with time, you will come to see this place as your home. Her words, sincere and heartfelt, planted a seed of hope in me. Maybe, just maybe, I could really start a new life here, one filled with love and stability. But life, as I was learning, is seldom straightforward. Just when I began to feel secure in my new environment, the past reared its head one more time. A few weeks after settling in with Mrs. Patrick, an unexpected call came from the police. They wanted to discuss the ongoing investigation into my father and Olivia. Anxiously, I went to the station where an officer handed me a letter found among Olivia's possessions. It was addressed to me, from my mother. Holding the envelope, my hands trembled as I felt the weight of its contents. Inside, written in my mother's elegant hand, were words of pure love and longing. She spoke of her deep affection for me, her aspirations for my future, and her profound regret at not being there to witness it. The letter, a mixture of love and sorrow, shattered yet healed parts of me. Her words echoed in my heart, affirming that despite her physical absence, her love had always been with me. As I absorbed her words, a profound sense of clarity settled over me. The betrayal and secrecy I had faced were now overshadowed by the undeniable truth of my mother's love. This revelation, though painful, brought a strange relief. It reassured me of my worth and solidified my resolve to embrace the new life Mrs. Patrick offered. With each passing day, the estate began to feel more like home. The shadows of my past receded, making way for a future I had once thought unattainable. Seated next to Mrs. Patrick in the warmth of her car, driving away from the police station, I realized that life was offering me a new beginning. As we navigated the roads leading back to the estate, the landscape of my past once filled with uncertainty and fear, faded into a backdrop of vibrant greens and grays, a mere setting for the unfolding story of my new reality. I didn't even realize I needed it until it was in my hands a letter from a mother I never got to know. It was a piece of my past that Olivia had tried to erase, but now, it was finally mine. This link to my mother, a connection long denied, became a cherished possession as the weeks turned into months, and the legal proceedings against Olivia and my father unfolded. They were eventually found guilty of fraud and child neglect. My father, seeking redemption, tried to reach out, longing to apologize and to reconnect. But for me, the path forward did not include him, not yet at least. Forgiveness is a complex journey, and I wasn't ready to embark on it. Living with Mrs. Patrick, who I came to affectionately call Patricia, was a blend of everyday routines and extraordinary moments. School, which had once seemed like a distant, unattainable dream, became a staple in my daily life. Patricia supported me in every way she encouraged my studies, supported my exploration of new hobbies, and most importantly, she helped me navigate the tangled emotions of my past. One evening, as we sat watching the sunset from the porch, the sky a canvas of orange and pink, Patricia turned to me and shared a thought that struck a deep chord. Jack, all families are built differently. Some are formed by blood, others by bonds that are stronger than blood. We're the latter, and I couldn't be prouder. That moment felt like the final piece of a puzzle slotting into place. The turmoil of my past had led me to this tranquil present, and the future was a canvas waiting to be painted with the vibrant colors of hope and healing. Patricia's words sizzled deep within me, affirming a truth I was only beginning to grasp the definition of family could be much broader than traditional bonds, encompassing connections built on support, understanding, and unconditional love.
Days turned into weeks and weeks into months as I settled into my new life with Patricia. The estate with its sprawling gardens and quiet corners became a sanctuary where I could grow and heal. We spent many afternoons wandering through the blooming gardens, discussing books, life, and my dreams for the future. Patricia, ever patient and wise, listened and advised, guiding me with a gentle hand. As the court cases wrapped up and the legalities were dealt with, I found myself thinking more about the future. I started to make plans for college, for travel, and perhaps one day for ways I could help others who had faced challenges like mine. Patricia was supportive of all my plans, encouraging me to dream big and work hard. It wasn't just the practical support that made my life with Patricia transformative. It was the emotional healing that took place. The more I learned about empathy, compassion, and resilience from her, the more I began to understand the depth of what I had experienced. The process of healing from the past was slow and sometimes painful, but it was also filled with moments of profound realization and growth. And now, as I reflect back on the journey from the shadows into the light, I see how far I've come. From a childhood overshadowed by neglect and deception to a life enriched by love and new opportunities. This story, my story, doesn't just end with a new beginning. It continues each day with each new challenge and triumph. This tale is more than just my personal narrative. It's a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the transformative power of compassion. To anyone who finds themselves in the darkness of despair, remember, the path to light often begins with the courage to step forward and the support of just one person who believes in you. Thank you for walking this journey with me through trials and tribulations towards a horizon bright with promise. As I stand now, ready to face whatever comes next, I do so not alone, but with a family chosen not by blood, but by bonds forged in the depths of adversity and strengthened in the warmth of mutual respect and love.